Is that okay, sir? Is that screen okay? Yes. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, very it's much. okay, sir. It's full screen now, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I bring greetings from India. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank and to congratulate Benha Orthopedics and Egyptian Orthopedic Association for this wonderful course and uh, thank them for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, I will be talking on basic and applied biomechanics in trauma and the fixation systems. Uh, I have talked about some basic definitions in a previous talk on knee biomechanics. So I will not touch upon those topics already discussed before. Sorry. So I have no conflict of interest with the products of organizations uh, discussed in this talk. Uh, some basic definitions. Uh, first, uh, definition of trauma, as you all know, is a physical injury. There can be mental disturbance as well. Uh, mechanics is a branch of applied mathematics dealing with motion and forces producing motion. Biomechanics uh, is a study of mechanical loss relating to movement or uh, structure of living organisms. Trauma biomechanics should be viewed on uh, four aspects really, and these include mechanisms of trauma, forces involved, physical dimensions, and the tissues that sustain trauma. There's usually a combination of these factors in real life. This can be represented in this chart uh, in a simple way, and I will discuss biomechanics in these four broad sections. Mechanisms of injury through the deforming forces uh, and applied in a certain, ang certain angles and dimensions cause damage to the tissues. The extent, sorry, the extent and location of damage depends on the properties of the tissues and the magnitude and direction and planes of deforming forces that are applied through the mechanisms. Mechanisms are usually the source and origin of energy uh, that causes the damage. The response of tissues is seen in repair and how we aid this repair using fixation systems is a gist of trauma management. Let's first look into mechanisms causing injury. Most of the mechanisms may be divided into high energy and low energy mechanisms. These include vehicular accidents, sporting injuries, falls, bomb blasts, gunshot injuries, and natural calamities. The common factor in these injuries is the dissipation of energy to the tissues causing damage and follow the law of conservation of energy. So when a high mass or high velocity body impacts with human body, the impact transfers energy to the tissues, causing damage to the tissues. The damage also depends on how this energy is imparted either blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, decelerating injury, or indirect injury. There's no clear di distinction between what is a high energy and what is a low energy, but each group may be divided into these subgroups. And examples of each uh, would include, uh, for example, a high energy vehicular accident could be a high energy uh, road traffic accident or a high speed train, air crashes, and low energy injuries will be low speed vehicles. Uh, cycles and scooters and like in, in, in low speeds. And high energy sporting injuries would include most of speeding uh, sport activities like skiing injuries, vehicular sports, uh, parasailing, paragliding, mountain climbing, uh, etc. And low energy injuries would be cross country skiing, running, walking, and team sports. And falls from multi story buildings convert high potential energy to kinetic energy at the point of impact while fall from standing position is a low energy injury. Bomb blasts are also of two types. Most manufactured bombs are high energy examples and the examples are listed uh, in the list given. While low energy bomb blasts are pipe bombs, petroleum bombs, uh, improvised pipe bombs and fireworks. High order bomb blasts have four components. Primary damage occurs from the blast wave and it is pressure-induced damage, so organs filled with air are damaged first. Secondary damage occurs by the shrapnel, sometimes used in these bombs, or fragments of damaged objects impacting the body. So this 
damages the exposed parts of the body. Tertiary damage occurs when the body is thrown out and it impacts another object. This could affect any part. Head injuries are common here. Quaternary damage is an injury other than the above mechanisms. And these include burns, crush, fumes, comorbidities, uh, the already present, etc. Sometimes mixed injury occur, uh, could occur when the person is very close to the bomb, when all four uh, damages occur at the same time. This causes shattering, also known as Brisson's effect on the bone. In lower order bombs, there is no blast wave or primary damage, but the uh, other three uh, damages are seen here. High energy gunshot injuries are those with the velocity of the bullet more than 2000 feet per minute seen in rifles. Uh, this is, uh, and low energy injury is seen with handgun and shotgun. Injury with the gunshots uh, depends on a few variables. And these include tumbling of the bullet which is rotation of the bullet on long axis, yaw, which is oscillation vertically about its axis, and wobble, which is oscillation horizontally about its axis. Precession mutation happens as is shown here. It tends to decrease farther away from the gun and nearer to the target. The damage has an entry wound depending on size, velocity, deformity of the bullet and bullet mechanics, and the distance from the target. After the bullet enters the body, it causes buildup of pressure and cavitation as it progresses, and it may leave the body through the exit wound. Uh, there may be multiple exit wounds if multiple shots are present. There may not be an exit wound in some cases. The damage in natural calamities is mainly due to increased mass rather than velocity in landslides and earthquakes and avalanches. Volcanoes can cause damages from pressure waves. Looking at the tissues, it is important we know the tissue properties. Normal properties and healing response of tissues may be altered by the physiology of the person or the pathological conditions. The lists are given here. Uh, all the lifestyle choices they make. The properties include biomechanical properties, uh, uh, include stiffness, Young's modulus, endurance limit, fatigue, stress strain curve. We have actually covered most of these properties before. So uh, we have discussed these properties and, and their stress strain curve in a, in a previous talk. It is important to differentiate between biomaterials and biological materials. Biomaterials um, are those produced in an environment external to the organism, but function in contact with the living organism. Uh, while biomaterial, biological materials are produced within the living body and contribute directly to the functionality of that organism. And the optimal properties of material include uh, the stability and the biocompatibility. This is a stress strain curve. We have seen this before. The lower one is for the biological material. This is the toe area, typically caused by stretching of the collagen, the wavy collagen bundles in the tissues before the actual stress strain curve takes off. This table shows biomechanical bio properties of different materials, biomaterials, and uh, important biological materials. You can see the stark difference between the alumina, which is a ceramic to the cancellous bone, and polyethylene in the stiffness. Titanium is actually closer to bone, and that's why implants are made of titanium to reduce stress shielding. This stress strain graph shows how cortical and cancerous bones behave differently when loaded in compression and tension. You can see the units um, of stress are very different between these two bones, the types of bones. Cancerous bone has a much lower stress limit than the cortical bone. Some terms related to uh, load and implants, stress shielding, is re reduction of uh, bone density as a result of removal of typical stress from the bone uh, by the implant. Load bearing implant uh, bears the weight of the structures resting on it uh, by conducting its weight to the foundation structure. This is seen with prosthesis and plates, while load sharing devices withstand compressive bending and torsional loads, for example, intramedullary nails. We need to be aware of the forces caused by the muscles around the fracture 
their displacement forces and ways to neutralize these forces. Reduction of the fracture will not be maintained without neutralizing these forces. And techniques of reducing and maintaining include application of uh, three-point forces and four-point forces through molded POPs or through the implants. Looking at how forces cause damage to the bone, a combination of bending and compressive forces cause transverse fracture uh, with a butterfly fragment. A pure bending force causes a small but butterfly fragment. A rotating force causes a spiral fracture. Pure compression causes an oblique fracture, while a distractive force is, uh, causes a transverse fracture seen in most avulsion injuries. High velocity penetrative trauma causes comminuted fracture and a blunt force causes segmental fracture. Compressive forces in the metaphysis and epiphyseal area cause impaction and split fracture. And types of fractures include traumatic insufficiency fracture when the uh, bone quality is uh, weak, stress fractures when there is recurrent um, uh, injury causing fatigue failure and fractures due to stress risers uh, due to the implants. Displacement of the fractures uh, occur due to forces causing injury, muscles attached around the fractures, and uh, gravity as well as joint reaction forces. The principles of management include reducing the fracture by countering the displacing forces and maintain the reducing forces until healing occurs either by the POP or with the help of implants. It is important to choose an implant and location of implant that neutralizes the displacing forces. A quick look at the repair process in the fracture. Uh, we all know the definition of a fracture. Fracture healing is a sequence of events which ultimately restore not only the physical integrity of bone, but also its biomechanical properties. And the types of healing are primary bone healing, and secondary bone healing, which is seen in the diaphysis, while primary is seen in the epiphysis and metaphysial area. Primary healing occurs when bone ends are firmly opposed to each other, like uh, after a plating, a uh, dynamic compression plate. There are contact areas and gap areas. Whereas secondary bone healing occurs in five stages, uh, starting from tissue destruction and hematoma, granulation tissue formation, callus formation, consolidation and remodeling. Stability of fracture is of two types, absolute stability where strain or interfragmentary movement is less than 2%. Here bone heals by primary healing. This type is used in articular fractures. Relative stability is seen where strain is two to 10% at fracture site. Here bone heals secondarily. This is used in diaphyseal fractures. And this slide gives the same concept. Uh, if relative stability is used in simple fracture or uh, absolute stability is used in a complex fracture, the healing is delayed. Strain theory of Perrin defined the upper limits of mechanical stimulation of fracture healing. Their interfragmentary strain theory states that the tissue within the fracture gap must be capable of withstanding the strain produced by the interfragmentary movement. Finally, the section where we intervene with the implants or aids to help injury recovery and repair. We will look mainly into uh, fracture fixation. There are two main uh, systems, compression and uh, splinting. Compressive fixation results in primary healing. Uh, this is seen with lag screw, compression plate or dynamic compression plate and static or dynamic tension band plate. Non-compressive fixation results in secondary healing. Implants used here are plating in uh, the following modes. Uh, buttress plating, reconstruction, bridging plates, LIS, PC fix, LCP, uh, intramedullary nailing, and external fixators. AO, as you all know, is the organization that laid down principles of fracture healing. It's almost synonymous to trauma nowadays. The main principles advocated by them are biological fixation, absolute or relative stability, preservation of blood supply, careful handling of the tissues, and early and safe mobilization. And the main principles of biological fixation are manipulation at a distance, comminuted fragments or out of uh, construct, using low elastic modulus, biocompatible materials, decreasing contact between bone and implant and limiting 
operative exposure. Different implants used are screws, plates, nails, and fixators. These are the ones we'll be discussing mainly. Coming on to mechanics of implants, screw is a device that converts rotational motion into linear motion. It can function differently based on the design as well as the way it is applied. Different parts of the screw are given here in this figure. It has a head, a land, a shank, a run out, rake angle, pitch, core diameter, thread, angle, uh, thread diameter, and a tip angle. Important ones are the core and outer diameter, pitch, and the thread, thread angle. Different types of, uh, are there uh, for the screws, the cortical screws for fixing in the cortical bone, and cancellous screws for fixing in cancellous bone. The sizes and uh, respective diameters of the drill and tap diameters are given here for reference. Uh, tapping should be done in thick cortical bone to cut the thread for the screw. Otherwise, uh, the thread of the screw will be damaged and sometimes will be unable to place the screw. Drill bit is used in the same diameter as the core diameter of the screw. Some screws are self-tapping, some are locking to the plate and some are self-drilling. Lagging is done to compress fracture fragments using a screw. This is usually supported by a neutralization plate because screw alone cannot support a fracture. There are two ways of placing lag screws. Uh, one is by method where you over drill the near cortex and place a fully threaded screw. The other one is by design where partially threaded screw is placed. So lag screw is uh, depicted here. It should be placed perpendicular to the fracture line, uh, that will give compression at the fracture. Countersinking helps uh, distribute loads from the head of the screw evenly onto the cortex. It should not be used in metaphysis where the cortex is thin. Uh, in, the, in that case, you have to use a washer so that it doesn't get into the bone. Plate uh, screw is when screw is placed in a plate. Here, the plate design creates a countersink and the plate is lagged to the underlying bone and the friction between plate and the bone is responsible for the fixation. Positional screw just maintains position of bone as it is. Uh, this is used to maintain the gap in syndesmosis. We don't want compression of syndesmosis. And these are the modes of application of a plate, compression, neutralization, tension band mode, and he they're healed by primary intention and buttress and bridging mode healed by secondary intention. DCP is a dynamic compression plate. The undersurface of screw resembles the ball. The sloping wall of the hole resembles the inclined uh, path. The screw hole of the DCP is shaped like an inclined and, inclined and a transverse cylinder. A ball confined to an inclined cylinder path, it slides down this and horizontally. As the head screw slides, movement occurs between the plate and the bone, causing compression at the fracture. So there are two DCP drill guides, one with an eccentric pole and a gold collar, the other with a concentric pole with a green collar for each size of plate and screw. The shape of the holes of DCP allow inclination of the screws of up to seven degrees in transverse direction and 25 degrees in longitudinal direction. And there are three types of DCP, broad, narrow, and a forearm DCP. If achieved compression is less, after one compression screw, a second compression screw may be used, uh, but not more than two is possible in this mode. Alternatively, if you have a big gap, you could use this Miller's tensioning device. Uh, this is used to achieve compression before placing the screw. And this shows how to use it. Uh, one side should be fixed in neutral mode before using this. Uh, and note the side to apply this. Fracture and plate form an acute angle on side of placement and not an obtuse angle. Lag screw and neutralization plate mode is used commonly in ankle fractures to fix lateral malleolus. If a straight plate is applied to a straight bone, compressive forces are greatest directly underneath the plate small gap occurs at the far cortex due to tension. So to achieve adequate compressive concentric uh, compression across the entire fracture, uh, pre-bending of the plate is essential. 
due to tension over uh, bent plate, the, the black bent plate straightens, compression of the opposite cortex occurs. We want the distal cortex to close before we close the near cortex. In limited contact DCP, contact with the bone is less. And the advantages are it preserves blood supply, encourages more callus formation, and has less refracture rates. And these plates are thinner near the metaphysis and are called metaphysial plates. They conform to the uh, bone well. This shows difference of plate contact between a DCP and an LC, low contact DCP. So the cross section of the plate is for the low contact DCP, the cross section is of trapezoidal shape and hence the bone ridges which form along the edges of the plate, they tend to be thicker and flatter, rendering them less prone to damage and uh, less refracture rates. Uh, low contact plate allows more angulation of the screw because there's less metal obstructing the screw to create the angle. The tension band principle converts tensile forces into compressive forces. Prerequisites to apply this principle are bone or fracture pattern that can withstand compression, intact cortical buttress on opposite side, and solid fixation that withstands ten tensile forces. Compression may be static or dynamic. DCP creates compression on the near cortex only. Tension band plate creates compression on both the cortices. And this is how it works. The tension band plate is applied on the tensile side of the bone uh, and not on the compressive side of the bone. When applied on the tensile side, it creates uniform compression on both sides. Coming on to tension band principle, it converts the tensile forces to compressive forces. And in case of fracture, the lateral gap will open up, uh, whereas the medial gap will be compressed. The number of screws and number of cortices um, uh, that have to be fixed with each uh, plate in the each bone have been recommended. Uh, and this is a list given that. Coming on to non-compressive fixation, Locking compression plate creates coupling between screen uh, the, between the screw and the plate. Uh, it is a combi hole and the screws are angle stable, fixed in a particular angle to the plate because of the uh, thread engaged in the head. It acts like an internal fixator, which is like an external fixator applied under the skin. The screws and plate function as a single unit. You can see loads are equally distributed between all the screws uh, in a locking plate, whereas it's not like that in a non-locking plate. Hence, hence the system is here is more rigid compared to a non-locking plate. Screw is locked in the manufactured angle. So it has a predetermined angle. It has good purchase in weak bone. Drill the hole. This is how to uh, put the locking screw, uh, inserting the locking screw with torque limiting screwdriver. The plate need not be compressed to the bone for stability uh, and it shouldn't be tightened too much uh, because the thread will be damaged and removing will, out will be difficult. Non-locking screws are inserted first to compress the plate to bone if you want compression and locking screws are then inserted. The bit, the, the bite achieved uh, is due to uh, screw plate contact rather than screw bone contact. Correct torque screw um, screwdriver should be used to prevent over tightening of the screw. And compression of the fracture may also be done, uh, but before locking screws are placed. Advantages of locking plates are uh, no contact with the periosteum, even distribution of the load, and the, uh, the type of uh, fixation failure. There's increased screw pullout strength, prevents, it prevents sequential failure and resists bending and torsional forces. Failure of fixation in non-locking screws, it occurs sequentially, one screw after the other. Whereas in locking screws, all the if it fails, all the screws fail together because they act as a unit. Buttress fixation resists axial load. It supports and prevents sliding of fragment due to axial load. Split fractures are ideal. Uh, plate protects the screw from shear forces. Uh, it is also called anti-glide plate. 
These are used for AP and metaphyseal fractures. Fixation uh, starts from middle of the plate and it's used for distal radius, tibial plateau, lateral malleolus, and sometimes distal femur. This is how sliding of the fragment is prevented. It physically stops the uh, fragment from sliding. Biological or bridge plating uses the plate as an extra medullary spring fixed uh, to the two main fragments, while the complex fracture zone is virtually left untouched or bridged by the plate. Uh, this concept combines adequate mechanical stability offered by the plate with uncompromised natural fracture biology to achieve rapid interfragmentary callus formation. Prevention of bone, uh, sorry, preservation of uh, bone vitality uh, relies predominantly on periosteal vascularity, which is also responsible for fracture healing. And this is done in those fractures which are not suitable for intramedullary nailing. So the plate should be about two to three times the length of the fracture. And this is a type of bridge plating uh, to reduce interference with blood supply and it's good for bone grafting. Minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis uses small tissue windows. Uh, it preserves the soft tissues and hence blood supply and also early recovery. Type of fixation gives uh, relative stability. Used in epimetaphyseal fractures, and it's not suitable when other implants are used. It is useful in uh, distal femur, distal tibia, and proximal uh, tibia fractures, where the access is easy. It is introduced through a, using a long periosteal elevator or by using the plate itself as an elevator. Extraarticular fractures are fixed uh, with this. And less invasive skeletal uh, stabilization uh, system is a type of MIPO, a handle that allows for submuscular insertion and placement of uh, uh, self-drilling, self-tapping, monocortical screws are used for fixation of the diaphysis. This figure shows this plate on the right and uh, locked compression plate on the left. Not the difference in the screw designs and the differences between a DCP and LIS have been listed in this table. You can go through this. Uh, there are they operate on different principles and, and so they achieve different results. Coming on to special anatomical plates used in specific locations, tubular plates have less stable fixation. They have thickness of one millimeter and useful in areas with minimal soft tissue coverage, such as olecranon, distal ulna, and lateral malleolus. Collar also prevent the uh, spherical screw heads from penetrating the plate, uh, and plate molds onto the bone shape after tight fixation. Reconstruction plates have deep notches on the edge of the plate and are situa uh, situated between the poles and allow accurate contouring of the plate in all planes. So the contouring can be done in all three planes uh, and contoured, the plate can be contoured well to the bone. Intramedullary nails act as internal splints and uh, they are load sharing devices. There are two types, uh, bundle nailing and, uh, and those which uh, achieve fixation by three point fixation. Flexible nails are pre-curved, uh, which is uh, three times the diameter of long bone at the narrowest point. Apex of the curve should be at level of the fracture site. Diameter of nail should be 40% of narrowest medullary space. And two nails of similar diameter uh, and make should be used. They stabilize by three-point fixation. Uh, if properly placed and contoured, they cause compression and counter forces acting on the bone. Bundle pinning was introduced by Hackenthal. Here the bundle, uh, the, the bending moments are neutralized by these pins. Cross-section of nail races loads equally in all directions. Plate is rectangular and is strong in one plane compared to the others. The polar bending inertia, polar moment of inertia, as you can see is uh, uh, proportional to cube root of the side for the plate and uh, fourth uh, power for the radius for a solid and hollow nail. Bending moments are higher for plate in femur. Um, nailing is preferred to plate for load sharing property and also early weight bearing after nailing. Biomechanical properties important for nails are the material, the cross section, diameter, the curve, length and working length, 
the extreme ends of the nail and supplementary fixation devices. Uh, looking at the materials, titanium is closer to bone in stiffness. So it is preferred material to manufacture the implants. Cross-section gives bending and torsional strength. Polar moment of inertia of circular nail depends on diameter. And for square nail, it depends on the edge length. Sharp corners and fluted edges have more polar moment of inertia. Polar moment of inertia is a, uh, for a shaft or beams, uh, it's a resistance uh, to being distorted by torsion as a function of its shape. Diameters affect bending rigidity of the nail. For solid circular nail, rigidity is proportional to the third power of the nail. And non-slotted nails have improved torsional stiffness and strength. Working length of nail is between the nearest point of fixation on both sides of the fracture, either by the bone, if it is not reamed, uh, or by the screw, it is if it is well reamed throughout. It depends on the on the force, the fracture, reaming, and interlocking. The nail is locked to the bone by inserting screws through the bone and the screw holes. Static locking is done to maintain length in comminuted spiral pathological fractures. It helps in periosteal callus formation. Dynamic locking is used when contact area is at least 50%. Axial loads cause compression at fracture on loading. Screw diameter uh, is four to five millimeter for humerus, five to six millimeters for humeral nails. And the hole size should not be more than 50% of nail diameter. In most fixations, one distal screw is sufficient. More distal the locking screw is from the fracture, the fracture becomes more rotationally stable. And the closer the fracture is to the distal locking screws, the higher the stress on the locking screws. Reamers must be sharp and the surgeon must consider the relationship between size of the reamers and the nail. Stability is determined by nail characteristics, number and orientation of locking screws, working length, reaming, or um, on reaming and quality of the bone. Moving on to external fixators, the different types are monoplanar, biplanar, multiplanar, circular, and uh, among circular, you have Elizaro and Taylor spatial plane. I think you have had an excellent course recently on, uh, on external fixators. So I'll not delve uh, deep into this, just going on the basics. Frame biomechanics depend on a number of factors and the list is given here. And the stability of the frame is increased by uh, increasing the pin diameter and uh, increasing number of pins, spread of the pins, multiplanar fixation, reducing the bone frame distance, pre-drilling and pooling and uh, radially preload uh, pins angle uh, between the pins and, uh, and stack frames. Elizaro fixator was uh, devised by uh, Gavril Abramovich Elizaro. He's a pioneer who developed it, uh, seen here uh, with uh, Dr. Dror Pali, who is another leading name in ring fixation. Taylor spatial frame is a hex support frame developed by Charles Taylor and based on the Kopf Stewart platform. Uh, this was being used in flight simulators and robotics and cranes before orthopedics adopted it. Having gone through implant biomechanics, let's briefly go through options of each type of fracture and its options available. So for transverse fractures with a, with a big butterfly fragment, uh, you can see the forces acting here, the DCP, lag screw with a neutralization plate, IM nail are options. For uh, transverse fractures with a small butterfly fragment, uh, DCP or an IM nail may be recommended. For spiral fractures, again, IM nail, multiplanar screws may be placed perpendicular to the fracture at each level. Oblique fractures can be fixed with pure compression with, uh, with a lag screw and a neutralization plate or an IM nail. And transverse fractures uh, may be fixed with K wires, tension band wire, lag screw, DCP or IM nail, depending on where the fracture is. For comminuted fractures, options include a bridge plate, LCP, IM nail, and an X fix. And these are non compressive fixations. Segmental fractures may be treated with a bridge plate, LCP, IM nail, X fix, or two DCPs. Gap or loss of bone is treated with bone transport or acute docking and lengthening. Severely comminuted fractures 
metaphyseal or articular fractures are treated with circular frames, temporary X-fix, joint replacement, and primary arthrodesis. And uh, distal radial fractures with impaction may be treated with focal pins, intrafocal pins, LCP or X-fix, vertebral fractures with vertebroplasty or plating, and split fractures with lax screws or buttress uh, plate. So to conclude, biomechanical principles drive good assessment and uh, treatment plans. It's essential to know the biomechanics of trauma, of the tissues, of the damage occurred, as well as the repair and implants used. The field is developing with advances in each type of implant, and it's important to keep up with the development for better patient care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank Professor uh, Sernives, for this excellent talk. Thank summarizing you. all the topics of uh, biomechanics of all the uh, types and the methods of internal fixation. It's an excellent talk, sir. It's actually a huge topic. I hope I have done justice to the uh, topic. Thank you so much. You summarized all the topics about the uh, biomechanics of in all types of internal fixation, sir. We are uh, ready to uh, receive uh, questions to uh, Dr. Sernivas. We have uh, many questions. Uh, one of the questions from our dear colleague, Professor Mohammed Abdel Ayal, uh, to Dr. Sernivas, sir, does the mechanism of trauma being high or low energy would affect healing process from pathological point of view? Yes, it does. Because high energy trauma, there is a lot of periosteal stripping, damage to the periosteum, which helps uh, in the healing of the fractures. Also, there, is, there can be avascular injury to the bones. Uh, uh, you know, the avascular segment of the bone can extend to, uh, to a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, centimeters from the fracture site in a high energy trauma. Whereas in low energy trauma, there may not be much of stripping of the periosteum, not be much of avascular segments of the bone on either side of the fracture. So yeah. that makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, that, you're right. Absolutely right, yeah. Uh, another question, what's the uh, rule of tapping of screw hole on purchasing power of screw in boon? Uh, tapping is very useful in uh, young patients uh, where the bone is very hard. You have to tap the uh, bone before you put the screw. Otherwise, the thread of the screw gets damaged. Um, in elderly patients, you may not need to tap the bone because the bone is soft. So it is very important to, to do tapping uh, to engage the thread of the screw. Um, otherwise, if the thread is damaged, you lose the purchasing power of the screw. Yes, uh, another question, sir. Uh, what about the ideal size and ideal number of screws related to the type of the fracture, either transverse, opli oblique, or spiral fracture? The, the the size of the screws actually depend on the size of the bone we are placing the screw on uh, because we we need fold on for each type of bone we are using and also the the number of screws we use and where to place the screws for the for the fracture the important thing is to allow the tissues to heal uh, to um, to heal the fracture yes sir uh, the last question, sir, what's the relation between working length of nail and the type of the fracture? So the working length of the nail, um, as you have seen in the slide that I have showed you, uh, type of fracture doesn't figure in the, um, in the factors uh, that depend on, the, that working length of the nail depends. Well, the, in some fractures, you, you need uh, uh, good working length. In, so, say in uh, transverse fractures, um, the working length can, can be reduced because there's a, there can be a good hold on either side near, nearer to the fracture within the bone itself. Uh, whereas in, uh, in, in case of comminuted fractures, uh, you need usually the working nail is between the um, interlocking screws. So the, the working length is longer in, in longer fractures. It, yeah, it thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, uh, your presence with uh, us tonight. Uh, it's a great honor that uh, you have mentioned 
all the uh, aspects of biomechanical topics of internal fixation. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation to join us tonight. Thank you so much. Hoping to see you again and again, uh, Dr. Sarnivas.